So um, let's jump right into it. Uh, given that the charter of this conference itself is AI, so deep learning is nothing new uh, for this uh, audience. So there are different uh, data modalities, so we'll be particularly focusing on time series data. So a little bit about myself, primarily I have a research background. Over the last few years, I've been focusing on building and scaling teams. Uh, my research has been product focused. Uh, so in my previous life, uh, with my I built a research team ground up um, for uh, digital marketing, and we made uh, material contributions to the bottom line of the company. And uh, also, uh, I've had background in uh, infrastructure, how to uh, scale or how to leverage infrastructure data uh, to make it more efficient. Uh, my friend uh, uh, Ira, he is a chief scientist at uh, Anodot, so he will walk through some of the uh, practicalities of what it takes to build a product uh, from an idea. So um, time series are typically, you know, we bump into time series in every uh, domain, uh, ranging from security to control systems, finance, operations, and media. So no, uh, it's not really, um, it's ubiquitous across multiple application domains. Uh, so. In most of the talks, uh, you typically have speakers come up, they give a talk for 40 minutes, and then uh, it's not very interactive. So I, I took some inspiration from the recent interactive movie from Netflix. Uh, for those who don't, uh, who have not heard about it, uh, as I've highlighted at the bottom, that the audience get to select, you know, or they may need to make, uh, get to make choices how the movie um, is structured. We'll not have that, that quite a bit in this talk, but I did want to get some input from the audience that what are their use cases of time series. The fact that all of you are here, which we appreciate, I'm sure you must be dealing with time series uh, data. So what are the challenges you face in your respective uh, roles in the industry? Event planning. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, event planning, all right. Anyone else? Fraud in credit card transactions. Fraud in credit card transactions, okay, very nice. Yeah. Tracking and uh, uh, tracking of shipments, all, all right. Predict maintenance, yeah, that's a very good one. So um, uh, Anodot has uh, in tens of clients, so uh, Ida will throw some more light on what are the problems uh, the customers of Anodot uh, uh, have typically face, and that's why they approach Anodot uh, uh, for help. So primarily, if you look at time series analysis in itself, you know, there are multitude of uh, problem statements one can work on. So given that this is, we have only 40 minutes at our disposal, we'll uh, broadly cover anomaly detection and we'll uh, cover forecasting. Now anomaly detection has been studied for a really, really long time. It's more than 100 years. There are, broadly speaking, four flavors. You can do, uh, you can employ statistical techniques, you can have more time series analysis, unsupervised learning, or now uh, the more hot area of deep learning. The funny part is that you know, people tend to uh, use techniques off the shelf, which don't quite work in the purview of anomaly detection. The reason being that the very definition of anomaly is highly contextual. What may be an anomaly in the context of networking may differ significantly uh, if you're doing object detection or if you are finding fraud in credit card transactions. So uh, people often use as a rule of thumb that anything uh, um, beyond mu plus minus three sigma is deemed as an anomaly. However, there are certain assumptions which this simplistic rule uh, assumes. For instance, it assumes that the time series is stationary. It assumes that your underlying data distribution is normal which typically isn't the case when you see look at production data. So even if one were to use for simplicity a rule like mu plus minus three, three sigma, you may end up with too many false positives. 
And if you ever work with SREs or people who are on call, waking up someone at three in the morning for false positive is probably not a good thing, right? So there are uh, a large set of uh, techniques out there. So the challenge becomes how do you select the right algorithm for the data at hand? And this is something uh, uh, Ira will talk about. And in the context of, even in the context of deep learning, there are a, a whole slew of techniques which I will cover a, a little bit, uh, ranging from autoencoders or variational autoencoders. And then in, in the context of RNNs, of course, you have LSTMs and GRU and many other variants of um, RNN. There's a pretty long history. And if you talk of time series analysis itself, it goes much beyond uh, 1940s. There is a lot of work done in statistics, in signal processing. So we have a pretty uh, rich history if you look, uh, in the context of time series analysis. So since uh, this talk is primarily focused on uh, deep learning for time series, so we'll uh, focus more on uh, RNNs. So before LSTMs became, was proposed back in 97, there were quite a few attempts uh, such as uh, real-time recurrent learning, time delay in neural networks, uh, backpropagation through time, and then extending the ARIMA model to uh, non-linear autoregressive with exogenous inputs. Uh, the main challenge with uh, these techniques uh, was the exploding gradient problem, uh, which uh, brought LSTMs to the limelight. Uh, so I, I presume most of the audience here is familiar with the structure of LSTM, so I'll not go, um, I'll not explain what LST, how LSTMs work. Uh, th there have been many optimizations, if you will, have been proposed um, on top of uh, the initial proposal of LSTMs. Uh, for example, one can use dropout, uh, which is typically used to regularize uh, uh, any neural net. So that has been shown to improve uh, the performance of LSTMs. And then adding a bias, for example, to the LSTM forget gate also improves the performance of LSTM. So how, how do we um, employ LSTMs in the context of anomaly uh, detection? So we typically have a two-layer architecture where you have a uh, LSTM-based encoder and you have a decoder. And then one can use this um, encoder-decoder architecture to find pattern anomalies. So what really distinguishes a deep learning model uh, compared to other statistical techniques is it is very effective in finding pattern anomalies. Now, conceivably, one can use techniques like ARIMA, but they make an underlying assumption that you know the seasonality of the time series. But often, uh, as the developers instrument their code, you know, you don't have any visibility into the underlying structure. So if you don't know the structure of the time series, then you cannot use techniques like ARIMA. And that's where LSTMs uh, uh, do a pretty good job. So in the example I show here on the slide, the blue is the, uh, the raw time series. And you pass this raw time series through the LSTM encoder decoder. And then you take the residual, which is represented by uh, the red line, and then you can you can then apply a simple rule like mu plus minus three sigma to detect anomalies. Uh, the other benefits of using uh, LSTM or any deep learning based technique is that it works for non-stationary time series. It uh, works very well with uh, uh, time series which have uh, irregular structure. And as you would expect, you know, once a technique becomes popular, there are many variants um, which uh, get spun up. So there are many, many different uh, variants of LSTMs, as I highlight here. Uh, as a, when you're building a product the way uh, IRA's uh, company builds, it's not clear that from a pr product standpoint whether you would want to explore and support all these models because you have to figure out the ROI of uh, these incremental improvements. So in the context of uh, deep learning, you know, Time series is, has been, analysis has been done for decades. So in more recent context, uh, it is often referred to as sequence modeling. You know, and then you have different flavors, uh, whether it's in the NLP context or speech or you know, financial forecasting and machine translation. So you can think of time series as sequences, you know, where uh, a sequence implicitly has a temporal component. So uh, 
deep learning has been used extensively in the context of uh, NLP and then also video and uh, audio streams. So th these effectively can be considered as you know, uh, time series with different data modalities. RNNs have been around since you know, for over uh, two decades. So more recently, uh, there have been alternatives proposed to RNNs. Now the motivation behind uh, development, de developing these uh, alternatives uh, stems from the fact that it is very hard to train uh, RNNs because of their sequential nature. Uh, they are very hard to parallelize. So uh, there is a significant uh, cost one incurs in, when training RNNs. So there have been techniques you know, such as uh, TCN where they employ a, a one-dimensional fully convolution, convolutional uh, network and they layer on top of it uh, causal uh, convolutions. Now, without going into too many details, uh, one of the challenge when uh, one typically faces uh, in the context of time series is you want to look as, as much back as possible so as to learn the pattern. So LSTMs do a pretty good job. So how do we replicate that property of, of LSTMs to have a long look back window when you are using something like a um, fully connected uh, convolution uh, network? So in this context, having dilated convolutions, it, uh, what is known as the receptive field, it increases the receptive field of the convolutional network. And hence, uh, you can look back uh, pretty uh, far back in, in the time series, which helps you to find these pattern anomalies. Uh, similarly, uh, more recently, uh, models based on feed-forward networks uh, have been uh, proposed to uh, overcome some of the limitations of RNNs. Uh, as one of the earlier speakers uh, uh, in the day mentioned about transformers, so it has been shown uh, to be very effective in the context of uh, natural language processing. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, that there are advantages with respect to inference and being able to, uh, being amenable to uh, parallelism. These are particularly important if you're running these models, let's say, on your, on your mobile phone. So you really want something which runs fast. And uh, uh, in the, particularly in the context of inference, when you need to uh, respond to a particular query in real time. So being able to parallelize is, uh, plays a very critical role. Now, assume that you leverage the best uh, of the breed uh, deep learning model to find anomalies. That, that's problem half solved. The reason is that if you go to conferences like O'Reilly AI or Strata, you know, it has become a standard where companies brag about uh, monitoring millions of time series and sometimes hundreds of millions of time series. So even if you were to find anomalies with high fidelity in these time series, the problem is you will have too many anomalies. You cannot practically dashboard them because if you have even a million, you cannot dashboard them. Then, it, what is, then you end up with what is known as an anomaly fatigue. So how do you really uh, find actionable anomalies? And then how do you channel that towards root cause analysis? Well, uh, the other problem is uh, conceivably one can use multivariate analysis, but however, it really doesn't scale. Because if you have 100 dimensions, then if you were to do an analysis in a 100, 100 dimensional space, then you bump into curves of dimensionality. One can argue that, hey, you can use things like PCA or SVD, but you have a more practical constraint uh, where you need to uh, debug that particular issue uh, within minutes. So these things really uh, don't work out in practice. So then what do we do? Well, uh, one can apply correlation between different anomalies to help uh, diagnose the issue at hand. So uh, this is a very simple example where you have two different time series. Uh, the red one being, let's say, the response time. Then you see a spike in response time. You can correlate with another backend metric, and then you can see what exactly drove uh, uh, the spike in, in response time. Well, well th that was an easy case. What if, if you have, if, instead of two time series, you have five? That also helps because you can have different sources of anomalies, and then you can, do, you can correlate between different metrics. But as I said, when you have, uh, you have, typically you have hundreds of time series. Now, even in this simplistic example where you have around 
uh, 13 time series. Doing this correlation analysis on a dashboard very soon becomes intractable. So one of the things, one of the uh, approaches which is typically taken is uh, to uh, compute a correlation matrix. So let's say in this particular case, you have a 15 cross 15 uh, correlation matrix. It's a symmetric uh, matrix. You can find correlation between every single, uh, every pair of time series, and then you can define a pre a threshold that any correlation above this uh, can be filtered out and uh, or or can be highlighted. The challenge again is that if you have any millions of time series, this correlation matrix becomes it's, it follows n square, so, so uh, it becomes a pretty uh, impractical very soon. So how do we uh, address this uh, issue? So uh, there are many different flavors of correlations which have been proposed over the last 100 years. Um, mo most often, person correlation is the one which is used uh, uh, in the industry. So whenever we say, hey, let's correlate these two time series. So by default, people refer to person correlation uh, without knowing that they are using person correlation. The interesting property about person correlation is, unlike others, that it, can, it is amenable to incremental computation. So you don't have to compute this uh, formula every single time, otherwise it will be very expensive. Why this is important? Because as, we, as the industry is moving towards high velocity data streams, imagine that you have data coming in every millisecond and going forward, going forward every microsecond then you need algorithms or you need means to compute in incremental fashion, otherwise uh, 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 you will lag behind. So using person correlation is attractive in particular because it is amenable for incremental computation. Uh, however, having said that, there, is, there are challenges besides the scale. Person correlation is uh, sensitive to outliers. So as you can see from the formula that it uses uh, mean in both the numerator and the denominator. And as we all know, that mean is uh, sensitive to outliers. So there are improvements which have been proposed uh, to make person correlation uh, robust against outliers. Now, that, as, you, as you would expect, uh, it makes person correlation a rotation invariant, and then uh, it is susceptible to heteroscedasticity, which uh, uh, Ira will also talk about a little bit. In uh, other data modalities, such as video and uh, text, we often see that the correlation between different modalities is not linear. So in such cases, using person correlation is not really uh, that useful. Uh, so this is, okay, so in the interest of time, let's move. So here we, we see that you know, there are different modalities of data. A lot of the focus nowadays has been on text, uh, images, audio, video, and going forward a, a little bit on haptic. So I'll briefly cover how do we address different modalities of data. We haven't quite get, gotten to smell and taste, which will probably come in the future. So uh, correlation analysis has been extensively used um, in the, when we have different modalities of data. So there have been talks yesterday and earlier today where uh, speakers have talked about object detection and um, um, analyzing video and uh, images. So very often uh, nowadays what they're doing is how do we take two different modalities? So let's say an audio component and the video and how can we learn by using two different modalities? So, uh, so for instance, uh, you can, ha you can uh, if you have a video stream, you typically take the raw features, you do some transformation, find the embeddings, and then you can find correlation between the embeddings of two different uh, data modalities. So one of the uh, uh, techniques uh, which uses correlation is uh, referred to as correlation loss, which is which has shown to be very effective uh, for face uh, detection. So here, for, uh, there are there have been quite a few loss functions uh, which have been proposed. Uh, as, uh, the most recent one being correlation loss, and this has been shown to be very effective in its uh, discriminatory power. So as highlighted here uh, on the example, the, the, the plot on the right-hand side, it uses correlation loss as the guiding metric, and you can see that these different clusters are far, uh, far apart than otherwise, 
when you're using uh, the correlation loss as your loss function. So uh, this is just to exemplify that techniques uh, which used to be very, which used to be used earlier for the, uh, the traditional time series analysis, they are very much applicable today when we have uh, sequence data corresponding to different modalities. Uh, one of the uh, hottest topics in deep learning today is uh, common representation learning, that how can we uh, use time series or sequences from different modalities and uh, uh, learn a common representation. Now, why is it important? You know? So there are many different use cases. For example, you may have a corrupted audio file but, uh, uh, in, a, in a video. So can we learn from the video itself and, uh, and uh, generate a uncorrupted audio file, uh, the corresponding audio for that video? So there are many applications where common representation learning helps and uh, correlation between different uh, modalities is one of the fundamental uh, building blocks uh, of common representation learning. So let's take a step back. You know, like I've talked about, I've, get, I've overviewed anomaly detection, I've, I've uh, talked about the use of correlation. Now, in typically everything is contextual. So you may end up with spurious correlation and what is interesting is if you, as I highlighted on the slide, as long back as 1897, you know, it was shown that if you have three variables X, Y, Z, which may be random, which are completely uncorrelated. However, if you come up with two derived variables, U and V, so think of this U and V as embeddings, right? You can find correlation between U and V where there was no correlation in the, or in the original variables. So one has to be very careful when applying correlation analysis um, because in the absence of the context, you may make inference which is misplaced and in applications like healthcare, it may have far reaching consequences. Uh, this is one of the um, websites uh, where it draws spurious correlation between completely different metrics, but you can see very high correlation uh, as long as 0.9. So it's, again highlights that things have to be contextualized um, before uh, uh, using them for decision making. Uh, this is another example that here, if you look at these two time series, uh, if you apply correlation analysis, then one would assume that there is very low correlation between these time series. However, based on uh, uh, human uh, analysis, we, we clearly see that the time, the time series at the bottom is essentially phase shifted. So they are indeed highly correlated, but if you just apply the formula blindly, you may end up uh, making a conclusion that these are uncorrelated. So having set the, the stage, I'll now invite my friend uh, Iras to walk through how uh, uh, his team has built a forecasting product and what it takes to use these techniques to serve uh, real customers. Thanks, Arun. So Arun talked a lot about the different techniques behind the scene, and uh, there are many ways of doing, uh, I think you need to turn off your mic, uh, many ways of doing the, uh, uh, for, so basically anomaly detection and time series uh, uh, forecasting are the same. So to detect anomalies, you basically forecast and then see whether the forecast matches the reality. Uh, and, and how to get that right, there are many, many techniques. And I'll talk about what we have built in Anodot as part of the product uh, that we have. So a little bit about Anodot. We do two things. Uh, we, d we, we build, a, we build a, a system, a SaaS service that does business monitoring, finding anomalies and helping with root cause analysis, and forecasting of time series. And the point of the product is to have it uh, available for any analyst with no, no data science required and no coding, uh, and the machine learning is automatic and in real time. And, and that's a tall order uh, to do, especially given the type of uh, uh, customer that we are working with. So we're not working with a particular vertical uh, solving for that context only, but we, we wanted, we set out when we started the company to, uh, uh, to build a product that can fit 
many different uh, uh, scenarios and use cases, all are revolving around time series. So all the challenges that Arun described, and uh, Arun, he didn't mention that he, he, he worked for Twitter and built the open source anomaly detection in R for the, the Twitter uh, 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 published, I think, in 2015. Um, there are a lot of challenges uh, uh, revolving around making it generic enough to work in a lot of different scenarios. So what I wanted to talk about today is uh, less about the anomaly detection part, but more about the forecasting uh, part of the time series. They're, they're highly coupled. Uh, a lot of the techniques are the same. Uh, uh, the, the only difference is in the anomaly detection, it's you're, you're trying to detect when the forecast, you, you, basically you were saying something is an anomaly if the forecast is different from reality. Uh, and in the forecasting use cases, you're trying to be as accurate as possible on any, any, history, any future values of whatever you're trying to forecast. The two main scenarios that we see around it is demand forecasting. Uh, how, many, how much inventory do I need in an e-commerce setting? How many drivers do I need to be on the road tomorrow if I'm a, a ride-sharing company? How much funds do I need to keep in every ATM so I don't put put too much money, but no customer that comes to withdraw money from the ATM actually faces uh, uh, no, no available funds in the ATM. A lot of different use cases uh, around demand forecasting. And then the growth forecasting is things that there is no direct supply behind it. Uh, rather, you know, will I hit the target of my next quarter? And I want to know that uh, well in advance so I can take actions and change my, change my course settings as a company. So that's, that's the use cases. Uh, the product that we, that we built out is machine learning based forecasting as a turnkey experience. So again, no need for data scientists and, uh, and there's no, uh, you just say what the data you, you want to forecast and uh, you push any data into the system and it should do uh, as accurate as forecast as possible uh, uh, based on the models that we have in place without anybody physically being involved, deciding what, is, uh, what should be used. Just to give you a sense of, of how the product works and the components behind it, from the end user perspective, they see the, the start and the end of it, uh, connecting the data, so pushing in time series uh, and events that, you, that the person wants to forecast. And then uh, uh, the system start, starts training on this time series. Uh, and a big part of it, and I think in a lot of the talks that, uh, that I heard today, uh, data preparation or pre-processing is a critical factor to making uh, a good results for almost any machine learning problem, and especially in forecasting. So there are a lot of different algorithms out there that can be used. Um, the algorithm is useless if the input to it is not good. Uh, so there is no magic uh, behind it. So, Doing automatic data preparation for time series forecasting, that has been the focus of a lot of the, uh, the research and development that we have done for this product. Uh, and it includes correlating with uh, correlating different data sources, anomaly-based pre-processing, and I'll discuss a few of the uh, key findings uh, in the next slides. Uh, then we train an ensemble of models because, just as Arun mentioned, there isn't really a single model to fit them all uh, that could work on any time series or any data. And, and I haven't seen, well, in all my years doing machine learning, I've, I haven't seen one that is the best on any problem. Uh, so maybe somebody will come up with something like that. Uh, I'm not saying it's not possible, but I don't think it's, uh, it's the case. There are different scenarios for different data. So learning an ensemble of models often pr creates a system that is more robust and provides better accuracy. And then the product continuously forecasts uh, after it's trained and automatically uh, reviews itself to make sure that it's still working as, as it was trained. And uh, if it needs to uh, retrain, uh, it does automatic retraining. The end user finally sees the answer in dashboards and alerts and reports that they can consume from the system. So this is, this is the system to, that we built. Now I wanna talk about uh, the more uh, science aspects behind building such a system, basically the considerations for getting accurate forecasts. So to get a forecast is easy. I can just forecast, if you want me to forecast what will be the weather in a week, I can, the simplest forecast is whatever I saw today, this is what will happen in a week. That's 
That's a forecast. The question is, well, is it accurate? And, and in what scenarios will it be accurate? So we saw that there are four key things for getting an accurate forecast. The first one is leveraging not just the time series itself for doing the forecasting, but a lot of, the, a lot of things that can influence the behavior of the time series. If I'm forecasting how many, uh, how many people are going to take rides tomorrow uh, on a ride-sharing app, I can use how many downloads of the app there were today and last week, and how many new registrations, uh, the usage of the app, all sorts of indicators that can help. The weather is a strong factor to say what will happen tomorrow in, on some days. So if there's a blizzard in New York tomorrow, I'm sure there will be less people taking ride, rides. But if there is heavy rain, probably there will be more people. So all these aspects can influence the forecast. Uh, and if you know to take them into account and build them into the models, you'll get more accurate forecasts. Um, ensemble of models. So there isn't... There are so many different behaviors of time series, and, and I haven't seen a model, a single model that would fit all of them really well. So by ensembling them, you reduce the, the you, you actually improve the accuracy and reduce the errors uh, by taking all of them into account. Other parts are, are you know, less obvious. So the first two, are, I think, are pretty obvious to anyone doing machine learning. Uh, number three and four are actually interesting points that we've seen as we develop this product. The first one is, how do you handle anomalies in your training data? So anomalies, by definition, are things you cannot forecast. If you can forecast them, they're, you can argue they're not anomalies anymore. Uh, so, like, for example, if you looked at uh, how many people took taxis, uh, if you forecasted it before 9-11, you would probably forecast some number, but you could not anticipate that there will be a lot less t people taking taxis because you didn't know that 9-11 is going to happen. That's an extreme case, but these type of anomalies happen co constantly, all the time, in all the data that gets collected about any business. Uh, so identifying them and accounting for them while you're doing the training is really critical, otherwise these models go astray uh, and they produce bad forecasts. Uh, another aspect is the different time, uh, different time series behavior, especially in the context of deep learning systems, deep learning uh, uh, algorithms. Um, the, one of the claims to fame for, for deep learning uh, um, algorithms like LSTM is that you can actually train uh, from multimodals uh, or even from time series from the same modality, but you can train together one single model that can do forecasting for a lot of different time series, uh, as opposed to the, to the traditional methods that you would train a model per time series. Now, it turns out, and I'll show in a second, uh, there, it's not that simple. It's not, uh, it doesn't work just out of the bat this way. So let me start with a point one. How, so I, I mentioned that discovering, influencing time series and events can really help forecasting. But how do you know out of the huge amounts of time series that you might have, uh, and that might be available out there from weather to any, any type of time series, how do you actually discover uh, that, they are, that they can help with the forecasting? So I, I outlined a very simple procedure that, uh, that we've been using, and uh, of course there's a lot of complexity behind it to make it work at large scale, uh, similar to what Arun mentioned. So the input is you know, your time series, what you want forecasted, the revenue of my company and my horizon, I want it for the next three months. Um, and then I could choose out of millions of measurements and events that might help me forecast that revenue better, uh, but how do I choose it efficiently? So the, the, the simplest procedure that actually works pretty well is to first start by computing correlations between your target and everything else that you have. And you have to shift everything else based on the horizon that, was, uh, that you need. So, uh, so you, you have to know the numbers in advance. And then, and then you choose some X number of correlated measures and events and then train one forecast model. This, this is a very simple procedure, a very simple feature selection mechanism uh, uh, that scales out really well. And now the main challenge behind it is, how do I compute this correlation efficiently when I have millions of things? And we have been using locality-sensitive hashing to speed it up. Also, which correlation function to use, which is, again, a challenge. And 
uh, I think I won't mention it, cosine similarity it seems to work really well because it's invariant to a lot of different uh, things that happen. So that's, that's, one, one, that's point one, uh, with some challenges and solution. Now, how, does, how do these really think, affect accuracy? Do these uh, uh, correlations really affect accuracy? I just wanted to show one example from our system. These are screenshots from our system of a, of a case uh, where uh, um, when you train something with taking consideration an event, and this particular event was Washington's birthday, uh, and I want to forecast something uh, ahead of time. What well, you see in the graph, the dashed line is the forecast that was done uh, two days before, uh, and then the solid line, the blue line, is the actual value that was measured after two days. So we can see the difference between the accuracy. On the right side, the accuracy was, uh, the error rate was 4.5%, and most of it came from not using that event uh, and not leveraging that event to get the right pattern for that, for that special event. And on the left side, um, or at least my left, you see that the accuracy improves uh, because it's leveraging the event while training the models. So it's looking at past Washington birthdays and past special events and understanding that the pattern is going to be different on that day uh, for this particular application. The next point is identifying and accounting for data anomalies. So here, uh, what we have seen that if you don't take into account anomalies while doing training, then um, uh, what you end up are with models that are not accurate on a lot of other periods of time as well. Because what happens with, with LSTM, they try to zoom in on and try to f model these anomalies really well as well as the rest of the data. But these anomalies are anomalies. If they're not forecastable, there is no point to try to learn them. Um, so, so they end up actually degrading performance if you don't do anything about it. Uh, so the, the trick is to first discover the anomalies before you start training and then create new features out of these anomalies. And we have two types of features that we create from them. The first, if they can be explained by some external factor, uh, either another measure or event, then actually enhance these anomalies in your training data, uh, almost like boosting does, and you, and you end up actually learning them better. If they cannot be explained by anything that you have in the data, then you have to weight, weight them down. You cannot ignore the data, and removing data is always ba a bad thing, but you can weight them down, similar to reverse boosting, if you will, uh, and then you end up getting much more accurate results than if you train without handling them at all. So this is, these examples of anomalies were not explained by any factor, and by, by, by weighing them down, we get a much, much more accurate results on the rest of the data. And actually, uh, we had about 1 to 15% accuracy. So I think we have two more minutes, right? All right. Uh, the last point is handling variation in time series behavior. So when you're trying to forecast things, you don't know a priori how, you're, how these different time series are going to behave. Some of them are going to be stationary, like the top left. They're going to be irregularly sampled. They're going to have multimodality. Uh, so there are a lot of different varying behaviors that can, be des that can describe time series. And Rob Hindman, uh, from Mon I think from, from Monash University, if I, I believe, uh, has this tool uh, called TS Features that actually extract a lot of different types of features that describe a time series behavior. Uh, this is a partial list of it. And the question is, can you train a single model, a LSTA model, with, with time series that have very, very, very varying behavior? Or do you have to somehow group them into groups of behaviors and only train on those uh, homogeneous groups? And which ones of these attributes you can split by and which ones you can't split by? So that was the question we were trying to answer. Um, and, and, and the potential advantage of one model, you have one, you train one big model that fits a lot of different time series. That's obviously, you need less data per time series. And you can, uh, uh, it's more efficient also in the inference phase. Uh, but will it be accurate enough? And which types of behaviors can you train with? Uh, and which ones uh, you cannot, you have to split by or do something else. So basically our experiment here was to, te to, to take all these different attributes and take every, a lot of different time series and compute these attributes for each time series and then, and then split them into groups. 
high strength of variation of that uh, uh, behavior and low strength variation, uh, and then score it, and then train a single, the middle one is training one single LSTM for all the time series, no matter what the behavior is, and then we do, a, uh, we do tests with a single LSTM for every time series, or a single LSTM for the group of time series that share, share the strength of that behavior. For example, seasonality. Uh, and we score them, uh, I'm going to skip how we score them, but give you the, actually the results, uh, the final results. So we, we tested a lot of these different characteristics one by one, and uh, the, the higher you go on the y-axis, it means the, the, the less amenable LSTM is to mixing these type of uh, variabilities together. So the two main groups that we saw is that if you mix time series that have seasonal patterns and do not have seasonal patterns and try to train a single model, it does very poorly. Uh, the same thing for uh, homogeneous variants versus heterogeneous variances. Uh, that's the, these were the two main factors that we saw uh, that, it, that, that adversely impact joint training of LSTMs. So that's, that, that's a very interesting, I think there are some papers that, that allude to these facts as well, but we've done large and extensive experiments around it that showed, showed it to us. And we're continuing doing experiments with some of the other features uh, to see whether joint, uh, joint relationships also have imp adverse impacts on joint learning of LSTMs. So uh, these are, so as I mentioned, these are the two main factors that we saw in our experiments, just to give you the three key takeaways from, from, from the talk. Um, discovering influencing metrics and events is critical for getting high accuracy, but it requires efficient feature selection and correlation here is, is the answer, doing it accurately. Uh, accounting for data anomalies really boosts the accuracies by sometimes up to 15% we've seen the uh, boost, and 15% is a huge amount. If you go from 80 to 95%, it's a, it makes a whole difference to your application. And identifying the, and accounting for the different time series behaviors is also critical. And seasonality and uh, heterogeneity or homogeneity or variance are the two key factors that we have seen for training joint models, LSTM models. Thank you, and I think we are out of time. And we, uh, so if you have any questions after the talk, thank you.